And good morning, everyone, and welcome to PerfWeb 86, day one. And today's program is uh, going to be a little bit of a hybrid. Uh, we're going to be talking about advancements in technology, maybe a little bit of a history lesson, kind of where we came from to where we are with uh, some information on some new technologies that exist, though I have to tell you that was a bit of a challenging aspect to this whole thing. And then we're going to talk about, uh, sort of mixed in with it, the, uh, the challenges that we as a perfusion profession are experiencing with the number of people that we have. And we're going to look at some things that I, some data that I think is very revealing and very interesting about this shortage, whether there really is a shortage, not a shortage, certainly one is perceived and one be, is being felt. Uh, but it's, uh, it's gonna be an interesting, uh, I think an interesting program as far as that is concerned. We're gonna bring a couple of people in, one sitting next to me, of course, Vicki Carlisle, who's been a critical care nurse uh, for many, 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 many years. And then coming in via uh, Vimix is going to be Bill Watson, who is a uh, perfusionist who came back from outside of perfusion, in, from industry, back into the profession. So was a perfusionist, left, came back, um, and uh, I'm interested to hear his perspective uh, on that. Now, Vicki, is planning to go to perfusion school. So she's uh, hopefully gonna be in the class, I think starting in April or June, whichever the date is, the April class or, or follow it next year, uh, and then uh, coming back to work with us, which is very exciting. So there's a lot kind of happening from a uh, professional p perspective, and I'm gonna try my best to give you some of my insights, I guess, if you will, uh, into that and kind of where we're going. So before we get started, uh, I have a lot of time to fill with what content I have. So you may notice today that I'm going to speak a little slower, <laughs> uh, not necessarily talk less because I talk a lot, but talk slower than I normally do. Uh, and take a little more time to really explain things. Um, so I don't have that time crunch that I usually have where I have to get through a lot of stuff in a short period of time, which is actually kind of neat for me because that normally doesn't happen. So very quickly, our housekeeping notes, we have to go through this and I apologize for that. To reach out to us, contact at perfusioneducation.com. You see it there at the bottom of the screen. Our call-in number, if you would like to be live on the air, and I would love anyone to call in. We have kept this phone number from day one, and nobody ever seems to want to call. Sometimes I pay, I, I have literally paid people to call. Um, you win a prize, something. Um, anyone calls in today, you're gonna win a prize. That's all there is to it. And it's gonna be a pretty, it's gonna be a worthwhile prize. It's not gonna be a t-shirt or a cap. It's gonna be something good. So. Call us, you know, be a part of the discussion. Um, the scroll bar is continuous down below there that you see for all of our social media, contact information, call in number, and that stays during all of our programs. Of course, we have, in my view, the best perfusion and critical care app in the market. Do you have it? Do you have our app? You don't have our app yet? <laughs> It's two dollars and ninety nine. Vicky Carlisle. Okay. I'll get it. Before this day is over, you have to have our app. And this app is really pretty cool. You have a perfusion section, an ECMO section, hemodynamic section, clinical calculator section. You have an IV dose and rate calculator, which is fantastic for critical care nurses and for uh, anesthesia uh, CRNAs in the uh, in the operating room. Um, and then a conversion section. And we've updated it a couple of times. The updates are free in perpetuity. That IV rate and dose, cal or dose and rate calculator is actually a standalone app that's only 99 cents. So you can get, 
if you're more of a clinical person and you want to, uh, your ECMO specialist, your respiratory therapist, this is a great app for anyone uh, who wants to have easy access to some pretty neat information. And one of the things we did with the app, which was brought up to me by uh, Vicki Word, Okay, so you're Vicky C, Vicky Word, the original Vicky, we have to call her. The original. That's what she demands. Um, <laughs> is that the uh, calculator for allowable blood loss had a fixed uh, hematocrit of 21% because most transfusion thresholds is seven grams of hemoglobin, 21% on hematocrit. But she said, I don't like that. I want to know what I want it to be. So if I want it to be a threshold of 30, I want to put that in there. So you can do that. You can say, I don't want the hematocrit to fall under 28%, put the patient information in, and it will tell you how much blood loss, and then of course, uh, non-heme uh, uh, fluid resuscitation you can do before that threshold yeah. would drop below that. So I think that's a really cool aspect. You get a lot out of this app for $2.99. Um, and even the IV rate and dose calculator is a very useful app for 99 cents. So please buy them. I need to sell a million of each and then I'll be retired. So if you don't mind, I need to sell a million, but one at a time. So if you could do that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, our Perf Web podcasts, you can go to any of your uh, preferred streaming platforms, uh, Spotify, Podbean. Is it Podbean or Podbeam? Bean as in as in as in green bean. Yes. Okay, Podbean, and just type in PerfWeb, and you can listen to our programs uh, while you're driving. Now you can't see the slides, obviously, but you have the dialogue as well. So we're going to try and incorporate some of that. I'll talk about what we're doing next year as we kind of move on with the pro, uh, my announcements here when I get into what our plans are, are for 2023, because we have a lot of plans for the, uh, that time. And then if you are on YouTube and you choose to make a comment, uh, as soon as you do, it'll pop up like that. And it will be a little notifier to me that somebody made a comment on uh, YouTube. Now it doesn't work for Facebook and it doesn't work for Twitter or LinkedIn, but it does work with sort of a new, I guess, uh, application that YouTube has in their thing. Because of course all these social media platforms are now competing yeah. for the overall market, right? Now let's talk about what we're doing for 2023 because today and tomorrow will be our last programs for 2022. Our uh, programming will restart February of 2023. Now, of course, we learned a lot with the Simula Sim Man, uh, which of course you can't see on, the, uh, uh, on the, the screen now, but we have our ECMO simulator. Uh, we have that going on. We're going to be retooling our websites to make them more user friendly. We have already upgraded our uh, Perfusion Education Library. We are adding uh, and going to be uh, releasing or, 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 or um, uh, I guess, activating our Nurse Web platform. Mm -hmm. We are in the process of creating our ECMO Specialist uh, School, which is going to be opening. It's going to be uh, 16 hours of didactic mm -hmm. online. And then you will have to travel here to Houston uh, to do the uh, simulation portion of it, the high depth simulation, uh, where we go through a variety of things. Now the program is being set up to be approved for ABCP credits, uh, for critical, for nursing credits, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, we're probably not going to do the physician credit line, but you know I think nurse practitioners can still uh, take the course and use the nursing credits. They're just still going to need uh, their CME for their uh, nursing nurse practitioner certification. This may also be good. I don't know. I have to ask uh, for your 
it's the a the American Association of Critical Care AACN certification. So you can use this as some of your credits for yes. that, right? So I don't I don't really know that system too well, but this is what you're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. So you, anything to add to that? You want to talk about maybe where we're going with the uh, with the uh, uh, getting this approved for credits and how that can work with the Amer the uh, critical care nursing associations. Mm -hmm. Yes, it will fit some of the critical care uh, credits. Um, also, it's going to prepare you for the ELSO certification exam. Exactly, that's a very important point. So uh, Vicki is going to be, Vicki C is going to be taking the ELSO uh, ECMO specialist certification exam, and we are going to be designing our program Correct. to prepare you to take that ECMO specialist, uh, ELSO ECMO specialist exam and pass it with flying colors and feel like you have, you know, give you confidence sure. to be able to go back to your institutions and not be in like not understanding, you will understand ECMO uh, and how the circuit works and the simulations and all of that. But uh, it is going to be a very tough course. There is going to be testing associated with it um, in order for you to pass this course. Um, and so there's going to be a real need for investment. It'll be 32 hours. I tried 16 hours of didactic, 16 hours of simulation here in Houston. Correct. Okay, very good with that. Um, I don't think there's anything else that I need to go over as far as that's concerned, other than it's been such a pleasure, it's been so much fun uh, this past year, maybe a little bit of stress, you know, <laughs> um, but we've had some incredible speakers. Uh, we have, of course, we're now adding uh, Vicki Carlisle to the mix, and she is such a good educator, incredible educator when it comes to understanding circuitry. She's gonna do great in perfusion school and she's going to be a fan, an incredible perfusionist when uh, she finishes that. So she'll be a critical care nurse and a perfusionist, both of which she is truly expert. Um, and, uh, but she's also a tremendous uh, expert on CRRT and understanding the CRRT circuit, how you can integrate it into your ECMO, how it's intended to run, your therapeutic modalities, how you should write your prescriptions to get the most clearance uh, for whatever your particular problem is, acid base, electrolyte, metabolite, whatever the case. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that very, very, very much. That's where our nurse platform is starting off as well with the CRT and the acute kidney injury. Exactly. So we're actually starting our nursing platform with our CE credits um, with the CRRT, uh, acute kidney injury, acute renal failure, um, fluid management, all of that stuff. And we have three lectures already prepared uh, to go live as soon as that platform for the nurse web, which you'll be seeing very soon, because a lot of, you know, a lot of medical people are in relationships with medical people, right? Yes. You have perfusionists and nurses, you have nurses and nurses, you have perfusionists and perfusionists, you have physicians and perfusionists, you have physicians and nurses, you have, you know, all of this stuff, CRNAs and, and, uh, and PAs or NPs or whatever the case may be. So, I think that collectively, if we can uh, make this so that people can do things jointly, then I think that we have a better opportunity to really uh, have an impact on the uh, understanding of what's going on, understanding of what we're doing, and uh, professional you know, responsibility for CEU, CE credit. I think that we can really have a major impact on that. That's my goal. So February will start 2023, new website, new programs. Um, the studio is gonna look a little bit different, not a whole lot, but some, um, and we're gonna be adding some uh, really neat stuff. So again, all of that takes money. MediWeb app, I need to sell a million of each for the uh, perfusion and critical care app and the uh, IV dosage rate calculator, and that will make the studio even more perfect and give me an opportunity to take some time off and go enjoy myself because I want to go travel and I need that app to help me do that. All right. 
with that said let's see somebody okay very good so let's dive in um did you have anything else to add to all of that no. that's the longest opening remarks i have ever done in my life I think so. I think I appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do half of my slides now. And then by that time, we're going to be bringing Bill in and I'll do the second part of my slides. But I'm going to probably just start making this very interactive and I'm not going to rush through the slides and there's a couple of videos there's a couple of websites it's kind of a I, I'm hopeful it's going to be uh, both informative and enjoyable for everyone okay let's go so we're gonna go with uh now, where's Vicky I don't see her <laughs> just you man no yeah. I want to see Vicky too <laughs> Okay, advancements in technology. Okay, so, so here in the top, top left-hand corner uh, here, you see Dr. Forrest Dodrell. And back in the early 50s, he partnered with General Motors to develop what is known as right here, the Dodrell pump. And many people at the time thought that the thing looked like a car motor. And if you think about it, it kind of does look like a car motor. I'll show you a little video of it. Uh, but these guys, this guy and this guy and this guy are actually, well, this guy and this guy, not in this picture. This is an assistant. These are two assistants for Dr. Dodrell. But this guy here is probably the first perfusionist, though he's not a perfusionist of record or on record. His name is Calvin Hughes. And he was working for General Motors. He's a General Motors engineer. He's a General Motors engineer. And he was actually a biology student before he was that and uh, worked for General Motors. And he took on the job of sort of lead on this project with this Dodrell pump. Ultimately, everybody thought he was gonna go to medical school, but he didn't go to medical school. Um, or I'm sorry, he was going to become a surgeon. He was going to go to medical school. He did go to medical school, but he was going to be a surgeon, but he ended up being a psychiatrist. So it actually makes a lot of sense when I show you the video <laughs> of what they did with this thing, because they actually used it on a patient. They actually did a couple of times. Oh. Then this fella here, very affable looking fella is William Thornton Mustard. Okay, so I mean, just looking at him, you would know his name would be William Thornton, right? Um, but he he uh, uh, is the only person to have two procedures named after him: one in orthopedic and one in cardiac surgery. So the mustard procedure for orthopedics has to do with the iliopsoas muscle and the adductor muscles for people with polio to help them walk and things like that. So he had made an orthopedic procedure, but then he also was uh, the, uh, for transposition for arterial switch for patients that uh, were born with transposition. Uh, so he was, he has the mustard procedure which addresses that problem and you have an arterial switch procedure. Um, I'm not into pediatrics and I don't even remember all of that stuff, but it's cardiac surgery. So he did both. He started out as an orthopedic surgeon and became a cardiac surgeon from that. But his idea is this pump here that fortunately was never used <laughs> and they were going to put in this flask monkey lungs and they were going to ventilate the monkey lungs and pump through the monkey lungs to oxygenate and remove co2 
from the patient into the monkey lungs, out of the monkey lungs into back into the patient. So that was going to be his oxygenator. Okay. And then you have Dr. Lily High, Walt Lily High. I think inarguably the most intimidating looking surgeon you could ever <laughs> imagine, but considered by everyone that knew him just the nicest person you'd ever want to meet. Now, both Dr. Mustard and Dr. Lily High had very big personalities in completely different ways. Dr. Mustard, with the bow tie, clearly a lot more sophisticated in his approach. Dr. Lily High, somewhat brash in his approach with that big giant headlight and so forth, but <laughs> both considered to be wonderful people. And Dr. Lily High's contribution to all of this was to drain arterial blood out of a patient of babies and a, a, a pediatric or neo, neonate in particular uh, a, a patient so you're taking the parent arterial flow pumping it into the baby and the baby's venous flow back into the parent so it was referred to as cross circulation and they did this he did this successfully on a number of occasions, but obviously you know that it was, you know, not going to work on a wide scale. Um, there were successes, there were also failures. Now, of these people, Dr. Dodrell, up in the upper left, um, it, probably just, you know, most of what I read about him is he was very dull. Um, and he looks, again, people are named very appropriately. Forest, Forest Dodrell. So, but still very driven, very uh, creative, and came up with some interesting things. So, this guy here illustrates how we would all feel if somebody came into the perfusion lounge or office or whatever and said, Hey guys, I think I'm going to stick some monkey lungs in a flask today and we're going to pump through them. So, who's in? I think all of us agree we would probably look about like this. And what I think is remarkable about this is that years ago, during what was the period of time where we advanced at such an accelerated rate, you could do stuff like that because you sure as heck couldn't do anything like that today. <laughs> right? The liberties that they had then where you didn't have the FDA and all of this and, and IRBs and everything that we have today restricting what we do, every I and every T, they literally were just boop, 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 shooting it from the <laughs> hip, right? I mean, I don't have a picture of it, but it's appropriate for me to bring it up you know, you have Dr. Cooley who had gone up and saw a, a, a pump up at Mayo, came back and thought to himself, well, I can understand that. And he went to a, this is a true story. He went to a restaurant supply store and bought a stainless steel percolating coffee pot and turned that into an oxygenator that they actually used on patients at the Texas Heart Institute. And I have pictures of that. I mean, it's absolutely true. It actually did happen. So to think about doing something like that today is absolutely unheard of, never gonna happen. Once again, I think this is about how we would all look. Here, here's your, and it's called the coffee pot oxygenator, uh, wow. Dr. Cooley's we're going to use this coffee pot today and I've made some modifications to it and we're going <laughs> to sterilize it. It should be okay. I believe it's going to work. Let's try it. And they did and they were successful. And of course you see where the Texas Heart Institute 
ended up, right? And then, of course, you have Methodist next door and all the stuff that they did there. I mean, you've got Dr. DeBakey, not to take anything away from him. You know, Dr. Cooley was kind of known as the cool gentleman and ladies' man, and Dr. DeBakey was not thought of in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but we won't get into that conversation today. But nevertheless, um, you know, he, Dr. DeBakey was sewing Dacron graphs to use in patient's aorta on his wife's sewing machine and then implanting them. So, you know, today is a different day. It's a different era. We learned from all that. So Dr. I William won't Mustard, show this. Uh, it's a vi that was a video about Dr. Mustard. Uh, but I will tell you this, here a little fact about Dr. Mustard. He graduated from high school when he was 15. And he was a year too young to attend uh, the university. So he just sort of stayed in high school and assisted the teachers with the other students until he turned 16 so he could go to the university. So he's just obviously a brilliant individual. Yeah, brilliant. And two, two procedures named after him, one in orthopedics and one in cardiac surgery. That's pretty good. Okay, so let's look at this. Um, and this pump was a pump. The dodrill pump was only a pump. There was no oxygenator. You were actually only bypassing the right ventricle. So we'll take a look at that. So pumping it from the right atrium to the pulmonary artery. And we can take a look at it here. There's no sound to this video, but there it is. And it definitely looks like a car motor. And you see the the blood here and what they're doing is purging air, changing the pressure. Uh, but you see over here, it looks like a, or the, the left side, almost like a piston. You know, it's kind of running like a car motor, right? Which I think is very interesting. And then you have the Gibbon IBM uh, machine model two that's sitting right here. This thing weighed nearly a ton, hmm. okay? And there's a, the, the, this exact pump actually lives uh, at Thomas Jefferson University where you were uh, at the main the hospital campus though, not on the university grounds, but the, the, the hospital in their museum. They have that machine. And they have this machine, yes. And uh, this was of course used for the, this is the machine that was used for the very first uh, successful use of extracorporeal circulation for open heart surgery. So the very first successful use of the heart lung machine was this pump that you see here. Um, and I'll show you a picture of it uh, being used in that procedure. On the left, what you see is a replica of the original DeBakey roller pump. And he invented this when he was a medical student at Tulane um uh in uh, 1921 or 23 i can't remember and uh, basically you he knows the stroke volume it has a counter each revolution you multiply it and so it was used to take volume out of a patient for transfusion to another patient or when you're giving something uh, blood product to a patient that you know exactly how much volume you're giving at any one moment so that was and that peristaltic design, this, what we call a roller pump, is in fact the same DeBakey roller pump found on all of our heart-lung machines. You've been to the operating room and you mm -hmm. see the, those roller pumps. That is the exact same pump design concept that we sure. use. Now there's some, there's obviously been some uh, advancements made, but the basic concept is the same. So if you looked at this, we talked about the dodrill pump. If you look at this heart-lung machine and you consider that it was a partnership between Dr. Gibbon and IBM, do you remember IBM as a company, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people, they thought the dodrill pump looked like a motor, a car motor, and they thought that the Gibbon IBM pump looked like a punch card business machine, and it does. So industries influence, if you will, into this 
um, was evident in the designs that they ultimately uh, used. Hmm. So there is the IBM, uh, the Gibbon IBM pump being used in the operating room at Thomas Jefferson University. And you have, of course, Dr. Gibbon, and you have Mary Gibbon, his wife, which is here, uh, acting as the perfusionist during this procedure. Um, Dr. Gibbon, interestingly enough, and the first successful use was an 18-year-old ASD repair, um, and it was uh, Mary, oh God, I can't remember her name now. I can't remember her name. I can't remember the first patient's name, but she did actually a, uh, for the AMSEX 50th anniversary, I believe she, she was a speaker. Uh, but I mean, at the time, I mean, she had a very big ASD and you died from an ASD. You know, you, you ultimately died. She had no quality of life and she wasn't going to be able to live a normal life, but she lived a good long while. She may still be alive for all I know. I don't, I'm not sure, but she may be. Um, nevertheless, those are the historical pictures that you see. But Dr. Gibbon actually only did four procedures with the heart-lung machine that he ultimately is given credit for designing. His first patient attempt died, second died, third survived, that's this patient, fourth also died, and he stopped doing it and turn the entire project over to his colleagues uh, because even with the use of the heart-lung machine, your survival in that case was 25%. So back then it didn't look like it does now, but we'll discuss that kind of as we go a little further. So there's the information for total cases. Um, and it was, uh, oh, there, Cecilia Babalek, that was her name. I couldn't remember that. But uh, in 2003, so she's, you know, she might, I mean, she really, really old uh, if she's still alive. But it was kind of neat that she actually spoke at AMSEC's 50th anniversary and did go on to have a very good, so she would have been 68 years old at the time. So that's pretty, pretty doggone cool, right? Yeah. Actually, she would have been 70, 53 to 2003 would be, would be, isn't that 70 years? 53, so she was 18, so that would be, okay, that'd be 50 years, so she was 68, that's what I said, yes, mm -hmm. I got it right. And of course, they realized that, hey, we're gonna need people to run this pump, right? Like, the pump was, it, this didn't work too well, obviously, 25% survival 75 percent mortality but it was going to improve and they knew they needed someone who was going to be responsible for it surgeons want to operate physicians want to take care of patients not necessarily be more technically oriented as far as being a perfusionist is concerned so the field of perfusion was born really out of this there was no such thing as a perfusionist calvin hughes there was no such word no such profession, no such person. You just, hey, we're gonna teach you how to do this, come learn how to do this, and you were actually the pump tech. That's kind of what they called us back in the early, early days of what we do. So what they looked for, the qualities they looked for were people who were very industrious, uh, and they would teach them how to run this pump. But in 1971, Charlie Reed is credited with opening up the first formal perfusion training center at Texas Heart Institute. So about 18 years after the first successful use of the heart-lung machine did a formal perfusion training uh, program get initiated. And Charlie Reed, of course, was our first professional society president with AMSEC, uh, and then also the president of the newly formed American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion in 1975. So I went to school, I started in 1977, and uh, the school that I went to uh, did not become accredited by the ABCP until 
eight. So we were opera. I was, I was being trained for a full year before we had earned our accreditation through the, um, ABCP and Charlie was the person who reviewed the school and all that. Cause that back in those days, he was very involved. And that was actually the first time that I met him was when he came out to see the school and interview, but he was friends with the guy that trained me, Billy Applegate. And so you have Texas Heart Institute, THI, and then you have the Tucson Heart Institute, which is the school I went to, which is THI two. So THI, THI. So they were very close. They knew each other very well. And that's how all of my, where I, how I got to where I am is from that. Let's see what's going on here. My, my, uh, YouTube's going crazy. Everything is falling apart here, Dave. Hold on one second. If you all will give me just one second, forgive me. You can add something if you like. Talk about nursing. Yeah, Bill. <laughs> yeah, Bill? Cool. Okay. Let me. Let me get this uh, to operate first. And you can, uh, why don't we take a quick second and bring Bill in and introduce Bill and we can talk about a little stuff that he's doing. Brother Bill, what's going on, man? Hey, good morning. Hey, it's good to see you. I'm here with Vicki Carlisle, our new uh, Nurse ECMO specialist and, uh, and uh, a nurse planner for our education platform and also one of our primary educators for our nurse ECMO specialist or our ECMO specialist training uh, 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 program that we're going to be launching early next year, probably uh, January, February. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping January, trying to push it to that, but it'll probably be February. Uh, anyway, for those of you who don't know William Watson, Bill Watson, Bill uh, trained at the Texas Heart Institute uh, graduating in the class of, help me out there. 1985. 1985. Very good. So let's see, I graduated in 79. So I got you beat by six years, six years. Yeah. That's Hence not that hair. much. You know, that's, that's not the, that when you think about it, that's really not that much bill. That's, I mean, that's really kind of amazing. And you've, you have, you have, um, uh, definitely, uh, uh, weathered well so that's good you know that's good uh, but anyway but we're going to be talking a little bit about this because you are one of those people we kind of discussed you a little bit at the very beginning who was a perfusionist and decided to go more into the business aspect you know industry aspect of it uh really you were still involved I think in perfusion, just maybe not in the practice portion of it, but ultimately over some period of time, whatever that time was, you decided that you wanted to come back to clinical practice and went through that process, uh, which was, uh, you know, for us, uh, in, 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 uh, of your colleagues who are in this profession, uh, you know, really well needed. Though I'm going to talk about some numbers that I think we're all going to find sort of fascinating. Um, and I'm trying to figure it all out, have some opinions, uh, but, you know, also kind of not sure. So I'd, I'd like to get some other people's opinions about it. So you have the perspective of being a perfusionist, leaving the profession from a day to day in the operating room, but staying within the perfusion community, if you will, but then ultimately came back to clinical practice. And Vicki, who I introduced earlier, Vicki C, Vicki Carlisle, is, has been a critical care nurse for many years, taking care of hearts, taking care of ECMOs, taking care of the high acuity, sickest of the sick, and now wants to go to perfusion school and is planning on doing that. And then coming back, of course, and I, I just keep saying it, coming back and working here because we value you so much. So here I have two people with us today who really either reintroduction or new introduction into perfusion as this community, uh, this what is a very small fraternity continues to grow. So, um, First of all, Vicki, congratulations on your uh, uh, your joining HET. It's nice to have you. I look forward to meeting you. 
uh, the whole team is going to be very excited about this program, the ECMO training program, I can assure you. So it's, um, it'll be nice to meet face to face, but this is second best form. So it's, it's nice to be with you and Joe this morning. Um, I look forward to adding whatever I can that will provide some perspective and some scope. Um, but from a statistic perspective, Joe, I think you've got some of the numbers that, as you mentioned earlier, I think the audience is going to find interesting. And then maybe we can collaborate here a little bit on how we draw some conclusions or at least our perspective of some conclusions. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. I think that's great. And thank you very much for that. That's very good. So if it's okay, I'm going to kind of go through some slides and then I'll stop and then we'll chat a little bit and then I'll go through some more slides and we'll just sort of let this organically evolve if everybody is okay with that. Certainly. Perfect. Okay. You want to throw the slides back up? Okay. Very good. So the qualities that they looked for with us. Are we going to be able to see Bill as well or no? no? No. Okay. So Bill, you're just going to be kind of in the background, but we will, we will, we, we haven't forgotten you're there, but we look it's for a, it's in, a role. Of Joe. It's okay. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. So we look for independence, fearlessness, great communicators, very thick skinned. It's a very hostile environment at times. It's a lot of stress, mechanically inclined, intelligent, creative and industrious, innovative, because you're constantly having to try to piece things together, durable. You don't get tired too fast, inquisitive. You're always wanting to learn something, being highly adaptable because the circumstances can change so rapidly, um, being interested being a very quick thinker you got to be able to react to things and make very quick decisions and somebody who just really is a doer now these are the qualities we looked for i have to admit the ones that have these qualities i love them dearly the ones that don't necessarily have that many of these qualities you know i i, I just wish they did I don't want to get into that because I'm going to be, I'll get negative and I don't want to go negative here today. Let's just say this is what we look for. I wish more people felt that way. I'll just say it. So the contemporary reality for us is that cabbages and valves are our bread and butter. You get a lot of crazy cases that get done, um, you know, and, and, and stuff, you know, the big elephant trunks and just all kinds of crazy cases that 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 get done of course the pediatrics are completely and 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 uh, uh neonates is a completely different world and different uh uh, uh you know group of people all together i mean i just don't live in that world and that is so different and i don't have enough experience in it to really even talk about it they have their own conferences they have their own there's everything about pediatric perfusion is so different from that of the adult world um, and there's far fewer of them in an already small population of people in the heyday of cardiac surgery we did over 700 thousand cabbage cases in a year today that number's down about 180,000 um, in 2015 not in today's I'm going to talk about today's but at the time I had originally written this uh, lecture there were 4,135 CCPs in the US which was the historically highest amount um, you're gonna see what the number looks like today as we move forward, I think you're gonna be very surprised. Um, we kind of felt embattled with Taver, but that ended up being a red herring because at the end of the day, w there is nobody in the United States doing Taver without perfusion coverage, whether it be heart-lung machine in a hybrid room or ECMO in the uh, uh, cath lab. Um, and the question, of course, I ask is, are we our own worst enemies? And I'll discuss why I say that. So, and you remember the number I said there, which was 4,135. That was from 2015. Currently, 
There are 4,655 perfusionists worldwide, but only, and that's certified by the ABCP, worldwide. But in the United States, there's only 4,212 practicing. So if you compare that to, and let me see if I can make this thing draw. No, I can never figure that. I got it. I got it. Okay. Here we go. 2015. Today. That's, uh, how much is that? 65 plus 12 is 87. And we've increased our ranks by 87 in seven years, six years, according to this, six years. That's not that much of an increase. So that increase has still not been enough. So either cardiac surgery volume is increasing, ECMO load is consuming our resources or the number of people needed to do the same amount of work is going up right because it's very small you think about it that is 4200 people is no lobby we can't get the government to do anything state or otherwise certainly federal nursing lobby you go to any inauguration and you have the nursing association upper echelon mm -hmm. is there who are we? People don't even know what we do. Bill, let's bring Bill in. Have, has anybody ever asked you, hey, what do you do? And you tell them you're a perfusionist and they kind of look at you like, huh? Yeah, for about the last 40 years, that's been the experience. I, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I think the one factor I would add to what you just commented on, Joe, when you look at the differentiation between 2015 and today, the number of procedures, we saw the decrease in caseload. Um, you know, I, I, I think a piece that that's, we sometimes underestimate is, yes, the volume has come down, but the number of cardiac surgery suites that we as a collective profession have responsible responsibility for covering each morning has gone up exponentially. So while the volume per perfusionist, if you will, may have dropped in that same period of time, even though we added 77 or 87 certified perfusionists, the reality is between ECMO and more centers doing cardiac surgery, the demand has continued to pick up. But to your earlier point before that, in terms of overall volume, and this is difficult for people in today's environment to really wrap their arms around. But the year I graduated from Texas Heart, 1985, our average surgery production per day was 42 open heart surgeries every day. Yep. Now we had 10 dedicated cardiac rooms, so it was a different environment. But you don't see that at any center, certainly not Texas Heart, not Methodist, not Cleveland Clinic. No one's doing that kind of volume under one roof. So now you're starting to see, we've talked about this, Joe, if you, if you draw a 20 mile uh, circumference around the Texas Medical Center, how many open heart programs in standalone facilities are there? Mm -hmm. It's a staggering number. It is, well, we're gonna actually, you're going to be surprised at those numbers. So I've got some of those numbers, but that's a very, you bring up a very good point. I don't think well, that, can... though I agree with you and I'm sensitive to what you're saying, I can't say that I think that's really the reason for what has been a relatively new paradigm of this shortage, whether real or, per or perceived. So, you know, I we'll see how that all plays out. I 100% agree with you. What I'm simply suggesting is, is that when we, when we make our, when we make our thought processes, when we articulate them, I think we need to include all of the categories that contribute to the ultimate outcome. And Fair all enough. I'm suggesting is that's a contributory factor to what we're dealing with. Is it the main driver? I agree with you hundred percent. It is not but it plays a role. I think you're 100% correct. I actually agree with you. 
a hundred percent. What are you, what are your thoughts? Cause you see this with nursing, right? Nursing has been, had been, in, has been in a shortage for as long as I can remember from 1980 and before. So has that, has it just stayed that way or what has changed? Of course, I think to Bill's point, critical care units have expanded. You have more need, you have sicker patients, a lot of those things. What's your perspective, your view on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's still definitely a nursing shortage. That's probably gonna stay that way. As many coming in, there's just as many that retire. Mm -hmm. uh, constant turnover, we move on to other things, like I'm moving to perfusion, so it's nurse practitioners now, so mm -hmm. many different things, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, the it's APPs, what I used to call mid-levels, I guess that's a term that's not used anymore. It's an ancient term, but that's what I'm used to. Um, the, so the advanced practice uh, providers like PAs and NPs mm -hmm. are really becoming the, um, the, uh, the general practitioners of the past. And, sure. you know, how many general practitioners really exist anymore in comparison? And how do we, you know, how is all of that going to work? And if we're constantly in a shortage, you know, we have this, and this is going to come into this conversation as well, is with ECMO, uh, if you look at the ELSO organization, they recommend that it be basically driven by respiratory therapy. That, you know, they're very pro-respiratory therapy um, uh, mon managing, monitoring the ECMO circuit uh, in the critical care unit. That's sort of Dr. Bartlett's view. I disagree with that, um, but at the same time, I also am sensitive to the issue that if there are not enough perfusionists for a service line that is trying to expand and become more ubiquitous, if you will, um, to, with some limitations, clearly it's never going to be ubiquitous in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, uh, a specific sense. Um, you have to have the human resources, the people in order to manage it. Bill. A couple thoughts. I, I, I know what also recommends as well, but having well, we started the we started the neonatal ECMO program at Texas Children's Hospital. I believe it was in 1989, maybe 1990. So I've been out of school for four or five years, and at that point in time, there was zero consideration by the hospital from an administrative perspective, the neonatologists, the nurses in the unit. There was no concept of perfusion not being bedside 24/7, and it was a one-to-one -one ratio. Right, so for every neonate pediatric patient, and in some cases adult patient, there was a one-to-one -one ratio with the perfusionist and the patient. And we've seen that morph a little bit over time, both from an economic perspective, driving that as a primary factor. I think the other factor that we are very familiar with, and Vicki can probably speak volumes to this, is that the COVID pandemic in and of itself drove the necessity for a change in perspective with regard to how we were going to provide safe and clinically sound care for patients that were going to be on ECMO. So it's almost as if, it's almost as if Elsa's position was a little bolstered, if you will, by the pandemic. Because to your point, they're saying, look, if you don't have the bandwidth with perfusion to pick this up on a full-time basis, then we're going to have to find acceptable alternatives. So I think the question then becomes, and Vicki, I'm very interested in your thoughts on this, is that, is that acceptable answer respiratory therapy? Is that acceptable answer uh, nurse, properly trained nurse ECMO specialist? It, does it continue to be perfusionist? Is it a blend? I don't know that we've got the perfect answer today, but knowing that we have some options for solution, that's what we should be focused on. And I think that that's the beauty of, of bringing you on to HGT. I think it's going to give us, I think it's going to give us some additional options and ultimately additional bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are very, those are, those are very insightful uh, thoughts. 
And uh, I do think it is a bandwidth issue, but I also think that when we look at ECMO, we kind of talk about that as I move along here, we see these surges of utilization and then over time kind of dwindle like this and then surges and then dwindle off kind of like this. And if we were to increase our numbers to a surge, which only lasts a compressed period of time, you've destabilized a market with a glut and that's very bad for people's quality of life, income, benefits, all of the things that we feel we deserve given the amount of education we go through, the amount of training that we go through, the amount of responsibility that we have, our contribution to the overall care of the patient. So, you know, I think there's a lot to unpack there from so many different perspectives, but your perspective, I think, is uh, is is very thoughtful and appreciated. I think your uh, perspective on nursing is uh, is spot on, and I think that that's where we're at. So, um, if it's okay with y'all, let's jump back to the slides. And so, this little cartoon I kind of put together because it's sort of. At the time I did this, there was a tremendous amount of resistance to uh, new technologies and doing new things that were not normally within the purview of perfusion. But here's our perfusionist, and we have our head in the sand, and here's progress, which is telling us not to worry, everything's gonna be okay, but technology is this lion that is going to come and it is going to eat us. So um, when we look at, so let's go back to, uh, let's go back to the to con uh, discussion. Um, when we look at that cartoon, it says a lot in the sense that um, you look at companies producing materials now that are specific specifically marketed that you don't need perfusion, whether it be ECMO or whether it be some kind of rin replacement technology or whether it be EC, the uh, 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 CO2 removal, ECCO2R uh, devices that exist, ECOR. You have uh, NRP, uh, normothermic regional perfusion. I talked about that uh, the other day where you go and you have a patient who is not brain dead, but is going to die. They want to uh, give their organs, so they withdraw care from the patient. They die, their heart stops, you have a standoff period, you do an emergency sternotomy, you stick cannulas in the aorta in the atrium, you put a big cross clamp across the head vessels so that you don't reperfuse them. Um, at, reperfuse the brain, and then you put the patient on ECMO, a modified sort of pump circuit ECMO, and you reanimate the organs for transplantation. And so that's a huge undertaking. And there are a lot of people who just like, I don't want to do this. I, I don't want to do it. I'm not going to go do that. That's not what my job is and so forth. Even places that do transplants. And that's uh, that's fact. So I think when you and you go to some of these things and they have preservationists who are filling that gap, they're not perfusionists, but they come in and they say they're perfusionists, but they have never gone to perfusion school. But technically, they're they're correct. They're not saying they're a certified clinical perfusionist. They say they're perfusionists. And my friend up in Nashville at Vanderbilt has uh, told me those stories because he has actually been in the room with people that are saying that. And he's like, well, what school did you go to? Well, I didn't actually go to any school. I kind of got trained just how to do this. And they're not even nurses. So, you know, if you don't fill the need, the need will get filled one way or another. That's a reality. 
Anyway, do you have anything to add to that diatribe? You know, Joe's diatribe. May, maybe just one, maybe one quick thought, it, and it, it, it deviates a little bit from what you're saying, but I saw this in my non-clinical time when I was more on the business side of perfusion. As everyone watching these podcasts knows, there was a period of time where there was a tremendous amount of roll-up, if you will, various groups being purchased around the United States by, yeah. whether it was Baxter, Edwards, Fresenius, so on and so forth. And one of the evaluation tools that we looked at, when we looked at an acquisition, was just how deep the perfusionist group had gotten into providing the full breadth and scope of services that were available. Mm -hmm. And so we dealt a lot with what you're suggesting where some groups had their head in the sand, i.e. some individual perfusionists, perfusion group owners, chiefs, whatever category you want to put them in. But those that were aggressive, progressive, open, willing to share, willing to to be, you know, for lack of a better term, Johnny on the spot to solve problems for the hospital, not only did they create a more stable environment for their clinical teams, their employees, if you will, but they created value for their customers, mm -hmm. both their patient customers and the hospital customer, mm -hmm. and therefore created more value for their business. So this is both, it has first and foremost, a very strong clinical um, uh, component, but it also has an incredibly important economic component, both for the perfusionist, as you mentioned earlier, the perfusion group that he or she may find themselves working with for the hospital. And I could go on and on. So the ramifications of us as a collective body, not embracing all of these technologies and holding them dear to our hearts. I don't care if it's anything from auto transfusion to balloon pumping to ECMO to any of the other more contemporary technologies that are coming on the market. I personally believe we're doing ourselves a disservice. We have did to you call it, nimble. did you say auto transfusion or did you say auto confusion? I said auto transfusion, you're confused. <laughs> I said auto transfusion. <laughs> you back me up here, what did I say? Dave, what did I say? She said auto, he said auto confusion. He did? Okay. All right. You did. You said auto transfusion. Very good. I rest my kids. <laughs> you do. Okay. I rest you mine know, too. You know, I, I mean, you see, you, I know it's, I know it's kind of tangentially uh, an offshoot of what you were talking about, but I think you would agree. We've just both been in this game in one capacity or another for so many years that we both recognize, I know, that it's multifactorial, right? Not, mm -hmm. None of these issues are dominated by one driver. No, but you know, and you're exactly right. And you know what? I'm actually very sensitive um, to the varying needs of people. So some people want to work, they, they just do, they find, they, 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 their identity is involved with work and they will give you, there's no way to give more than 100%. So recognize it, they'll give you, they will do everything they can to give you 150%. And then you have people who they will give you 100, they will give you what is expected of them, but their life make is more important than their job and i can't not respect that and appreciate that because i you know i don't want this is a totally different topic but i sacrificed my family for this profession for my job because that was my identity i can't expect everyone to feel that way and should not expect everyone to feel that way because everyone is an individual and we all have different needs, interests, you know, motivations, whatever it may be. Um, so you have to accept that in people and find those that fit into the various puzzle pieces that you need. You need people like that to help us all remember uh, that we have to stay sane and then you also need those that are hard driven that just 
That's the way they're built. That's what they're going to do. And then everything in between to have a successful group, a successful company. You can't have all of one or all of the other or disproportionate one way or the other. You have to be very uh, balanced in, in, in the kind of people that you have working and in this profession. But, and with that said, I think it is grossly over or underappreciated or understood that you don't make the kind of money that we make and you can't be in this profession if you want a job with consistent hours, if you want to be a, a department manager at Walmart or Target or you want to do security or you want to do you want to work in the laboratory of the hospital and you want scheduled hours with scheduled time off and most of the time not having to work holidays or in the middle of the night that you have to not do this job because that's not how this job actually works this profession and I think that's missing in the entrance into school in explaining to people what this profession really demands of the, what the minimum demand is. And I think the minimum demand for us, not unlike pilots and astronauts and law enforcement or things like fire department, whatever it may be, physicians, surgeons, you know, whatever, the demands on us at a minimum level, way higher than it is for other professions that have more regular hours and aren't dealing with what we deal with. That's the, I think your points are well made. I think the other interesting thing, and maybe you've had this experience as well, is that you described two different ends of the spectrum, right? The for lack of a better term, the overachiever, the person that is driven and their identity is working hard, driving hard every single day. The other side of that equation is I have some other things in my life that might be important to me. I want to do a really good job, but I also want to have some life balance. I think the piece that needs to be added there, or at least recognized, is that everybody goes through different, for lack of a better term, different seasons in their life, right? So you may have people that within that continuum that you're talking about needing, not all of one, not all of the other, but a nice blend. As people grow and age, their, their needs and their perspective about their job oftentimes changes as well. Mm -hmm. So there's, again, it's, there's always a number of different factors is taken into consideration. And I think the groups and the, the businesses that are successful approach these things in a very thoughtful and open-minded way. Because if you've got only one perspective and your horse blinders on, I, I think sometimes you're going to make very good decisions, but I think the chances of missing an opportunity to have an even better company, a more stable and happy group of individuals, I think you miss that opportunity. Absolutely. But I do. I, I think you're right. I agree with you. Uh, but I feel like, you know, I still feel that we are doing ourselves a disservice by not really explaining to people what it is they're getting themselves into before they actually go to perfusion training to do what it is uh, they ultimately want to do. I do think that's a short, I believe that's a shortfall in our system. And as a result, we get people who are in shock and like, well, I don't want to work this hard. This isn't what I signed up for. Well, you know, I mean, you're really not working that hard. And, you know, this is exactly what you signed up for. And there's a disconnect and that's going to bite us with trying to rush people through get them into perfusion school, get them out because of this shortage, whether real or perceived, doesn't make any difference. There's a shortage. How about nursing? What do you see as far as what 
a nurse expects her life to his or her life to be when they come to the critical care unit so you go to nursing school you get your basic nursing experience in a hospital on the floor somewhere you know you're doing that thing and somewhere along the way you go i want to be in critical care you got to go through some process you get that job and then you're working in critical care because i know you show up to work an hour before your shift starts you're usually there an hour to two hours after your shift ends and you work a 12-hour shift so that doesn't leave a whole lot of time for personal life and family and everything you got called in uh, uh, any number of times during the covid crisis but even prior to the covid crisis we would have surges in acuity and nurses like yourself were coming in and i was seeing you working five days six days seven days eight days in a row at 12 hours with three hours on either side spent there when you didn't need to be there is that something that you that you just had to be there but you weren't obligated to be there if i could say it that way what do you see with the new nurses coming out the expectations of work-life balance and the reality of do you understand what you do and how much you know what what kind of a you're being compensated for this because you're being paid a lot more than somebody that is again a not that there's anything wrong with department managers at Walmart. They're great people and they work very hard and I respect them tremendously, but the compensation, there's a gap. And that's what we're paid for. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's true. The newer nurses don't expect the job to be what it is. Uh, they go through school a little faster. They don't come out with the same skills, uh, especially during shortages, because they push them through. Um, they expect the three-day week be done, be home, and uh, that's not necessarily always how it is, especially in critical care. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's definitely differences. You still get the ones that come out and want to learn everything and want to be there every day. Uh, yeah, definitely. Is it a selection process? Is it, you know, is it just, just such a supply-demand imbalance that there's no way to actually filter who's getting into school. You just have to, you're applied to nursing school, great, we need nurses, come on. Well, we go through that phase, and then that's also what the, what the hospitals hire in. You know, we go through this, we'll take associate nurses. Oh, wait, no, now we only want bachelor's nurses. What do we need at the time? Uh, I mean, same thing. They come out expecting to make a certain amount of money. That's not necessarily what they're going to make. Uh, without the hours put in, without that extra bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. um, it's just kind of pushing it all through. Fill mm -hmm. the spots when they're there, then what do you do? Mm -hmm. So you go through that phase too, where you have a glut. For sure. And you're being sure. called off. And then the hospitals are, oh, well, we're switching to all BSNs again. And then we have all these associates, but where they go, they have to go back and get their bachelor's. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, definitely some of that aspect as well interesting because we're of course our programs are shifting to now master's degrees mm -hmm. so you know the uh the programs have gone from bachelor's and then your training uh for perfusionists to now the program has to either provide a master's or you have to have a master's i guess to get in i'm not sure exactly how that's working mm -hmm. but it's i it may be that you the programs have to be a master's program. So you get your bachelor's, then you have to go and make it a master's. Like CRNAs are like that, I believe. Sure. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to the slides. So very quickly, I don't want to spend much time on this, but in 1979, when I finished my training, uh, I was trained to harvest vein, open, of course, they didn't have anything like EBH, put in radio arterial lines, first assist. We even floated swans. Uh, you did a ton of cases, uh, anything to do with anything, balloon pumps. Uh, we were the only ones that could touch it. Uh, in 1982, first time that I heard about cell savers. Uh, we had unlimited cases, balloon pumps, ECMO, VADs, LVADs, we used to call them, auto transfusion, anything new, we wanted to take it and gobble it up. Um, but somewhere, you know, things did change. In the early 70s, there were about 300 or 400 centers doing cardiac surgery. By 1990, that number jumped to 850, and today it's plus or minus 
1,150 without that number changing very much over the past 10 to 12 years. Um, here we see the growth in the number of hospitals on the top graph with the darker line showing the hospital increasing and the volume of procedures being done during that high growth period actually coming down. Of course, this doesn't have uh, uh, things on uh, 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 PCA, you know, PTCA and stents and all of that kind of thing, which is likely the responsible uh, reason for this. And interestingly, uh, we, uh, you see this big increase in the number of hospitals doing uh, surgery while the procedures are going down. And you look at the bottom and you look at very low volume and very high volume, which you talked to about uh, earlier, Bill, where the high volume centers lost volume for the low volume centers as they started adding more and more cases and more and more centers. But again, that has not changed much uh, in the past, uh, probably, I would say 12 to 15 years. Here is a real yeah. issue. Go ahead. You were going to say something? No, 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 no. Go, go ahead. Okay. Um, you look at the uh, this graph, and basically what you see is the red line is the baseline cardiac surgeons. The purple line that you see going up this way is the population over 65, which is increasing uh, very rapidly. And if you were to train... 150 cardiac surgeons per year, you can see that it barely keeps up. It, at 75 per year, which is the green line, you see that the volume goes down. Uh, and so the only way we're going to be able to continue to provide cardiac surgery services to through 2030, which is now only eight years away, and no one wants to fill the cardiac surgery slots. So they're not training 75 new cardiac surgeons a year, certainly not even close to that and not close to 150, certainly at all. So the number of cardiac surgeons to the need is patient need is dropping precipitously. And that is also the case with perfusion. Um, so with, of course, the advent of all of the different things, you know, this is a little joke that they made, cardiac surgeons with TAVR and all that kind of thing, stenting, but of course we all know that really didn't happen. So it's a silly cartoon. But I changed this a little, and uh, I should have changed it, but it says Cardiac Surgeon Express. This should really say Perfusion Express, and we're on the Express to Extinction, and here we are, just all dinosaurs. We have to learn from this. This is actually a cartoon that uh, was used, uh, it was done by Charles Parker, but it was uh, uh, the original cartoon, but then Dr. Mack up in uh, Plano changed this and added the cardiac surgeon, and then I stole it from him. <laughs> and here he is talking about minimally invasive and robotic surgery. I won't get into this too deeply, but he is really encouraging his cardiac surgeon colleagues to get those catheter uh, skills, uh, wire skills, and so forth that are needed because that is ultimately going to be the future of cardiac surgery. And if you don't, can't do things minimally invasive, robotic, have good wire skills, uh, you will in fact be on the extinction uh, uh, express. And I think that is also the case for us that as we we can't do this. We don't have the bandwidth to manage this. We don't want to go do NRP. We don't want to go, uh, manage these ECMOs and so forth. As we continue to do that, we will lose ground on what we are able to do because the number of cases ultimately will continue to drop as these new procedures or new ways of managing those problems 
become more and more popular. We went from 700,000 cabbages plus to 180 minus, 180,000 minus in a 20 year span. I, I don't see it going up again uh, in the near future, even with the aging population. Uh, I think they're just gonna keep coming out with new procedures. So uh, when we look at uh, data on perfusion training, I'm gonna show you more contemporary data, but this is the uh, number of uh, programs that existed uh, up till 2015. I'm gonna show you some more current data. Uh, this is uh, showing the, um, the uh, graduation rate an employment rate and it's very interesting that in 2007 unlike today which you're basically hired before you go to perfusion school you before you even get to school you've been hired and anyone not hired before they go to school is hired while they're in their first uh, year or first rotation uh, whatever the case may be but the graduation rate was only 81 percent with an employment rate of 88.7 percent what a far cry that is. It look at the change just from then to 2013. But what this shows you is, you see it's high, goes down, goes back up. It's cyclical. And that cycle will happen again. And it's the way it is. It's sort of us uh, going around the sun every year. It's that is sort of how perfusion and a lot of these professions are. The nursing, like you said, get everybody in. We take associate's degree in the ICU. No, now we gotta have a bachelor's degree and then something else will happen and you'll see that change again. And even diploma level, because if you have enough of a need, that'll happen. Uh, back in, exactly. Uh, up until 2013, 59% uh, of perfusionists were uh, uh, less than, or of the 139 perfusionists, actually I take that back by mistake, were less than 25 years old. 71 of the 139 were less than 35, 26 to 35. So you can see there the disproportionately very young population. It'll be interesting to see what that looked like today, which I do have that data. Um, I wanted to thank somebody on here and I wanna put a big heart by his name if I can, Jerry Dobbs. The reason we have perfusioneducation.com is because of Jerry. When Jerry uh, opened the website perfusioneducation.com back in, I think it was in the early 90s um, when websites were brand new. And he had that, he interviewed me for one of his very first podcasts that he was doing. And Jerry has since died and uh, uh, he died from cancer, lived out in California. And um, anyway, he gave me the domain and just asked me to please do something good with it. And that's why we have perfusioneducation.com today. That's the originator of it and how I got it. And Jerry was a, uh, a, a wonderful soul and his wife was a wonderful person as well. Both have passed. Um, here you see what used to be uh, uh, our oxygenator. Here's the heart lung machine itself and this is a Travanol bag. Bill, you probably have seen this before. Here is a Shiley S100A oxygenator. It's a bubble oxygenator. The venous blood came in here. There was an oxygen sparger plate. The oxygen came in here. It bubbled up the heat exchanger, spilled over, went through a defomer, and then filled this uh, arterial reservoir that we would then pump to the patient. It's different, of course, today. We have venous reservoirs and we use hollow fiber, uh, uh, micropores hollow fiber oxygenators. Here's that S100, that uh, uh, Shiley uh, 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 oxygenator over here. This is, this is not the actual pump. I wasn't actually in this room using this pump, but this is, what I trained on. This is the 
oxygen. It's so interesting that this is the Seacris blender, which hasn't changed in all of these years, because this is very old, very old picture. And this is the Sarns pump here. Um, I think it's the Sarns 5000 was the n name of it, the number of it. And this is basically, this is the oxygenator that I uh, was trained on. These are the heart lung machines of today. And I'll show you some pictures of some kind of newer ones as we move forward. Here's uh, one here. And of course, this is a venous reservoir now. And then it pumps through the lung uh, and then out of the lung as uh, venous blood and then arterialized blood over here. This is what oxygenator uh, operating rooms used to look like. This is Texas Heart Institute. And somewhere in there, I cannot tell you where, is Dr. Cooley. Somewhere in there. This is what they look like today. And this is actually one of my favorite pictures of all time. Here's the surgeon paying attention to what he's doing. Here, it doesn't even have an assistant. Here is the, uh, the scrub nurse or scrub uh, technologist, whichever the case may be. Here is the perfusionist laser focused on whatever he's doing over here and paying attention to probably something on this monitor. And then there's anesthesia always wondering, what the hell are they doing over there? <laughs> and that's the truth. I love that picture. Yeah. Confused. Okay. So much winning if I get elected yeah. that you may get bored with winning. Believe me. I agree. You'll never get bored with winning. We no. never get bored. No. We've got to win again. Perfusion has to win again. So um, there's new and emerging technologies from perfusionists. There's VAD and ECMO. There's uh, uh, the Paris, uh, uh, France um, uh, trial that has been be going on for a while. Do it mobile eCPR, there's Angiovac, there's CRRT, there's TPE. I mean, all of these, there's cancer therapies, of course, like HIPAC, there's therapeutic hypothermia for uh, strokes or for, uh, for uh, cardiac arrest. There's so many opportunities for us to contribute. There's, of course, I don't have it on here. There's NRP, there's organ preservation. There's so many places for us to insert ourselves to make sure that we, if we aren't the only person doing it, we are one of the people doing it and we have our hands and we learn how to do it. We know how to do it. It is part of our typical uh, practice guidelines. It falls under our not necessarily sole purview, but it is within our purview to be able to do these things. Because if we don't, we don't learn how to do them. We don't involve, it's going to be problematic. Let's see how we're doing on time. Pretty good. Um, VAD ECMO, uh, we talked about that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I kind of want to get to today's data. Um, you see here ECMO from 2006 to 2011 increased 433%. It, I don't have the data from today, but I can assure you it is even higher, especially post-COVID. And we had some encouraging outcomes with COVID. I mean, some of our outcomes were terrible. Let's go to discussion if we can. Some of our outcomes were horrible horrible but we learned a lot and we had some really good successes and you know what if you're one of the successes that's really a good thing for you and your family i understand that there's this you know okay we have to recognize that you know we only have we can't do this because we will run out of money we won't be able to help anybody so you have the helping the individual and then there's what's best for the overall community and making those decisions are way above my pay grade. But nevertheless, we had some encouraging outcomes and right now we're managing an ECMO who uh, was post cabbage, had lung problems prior to his surgery, went into full ARDS, ended up going on VV ECMO Failed VV ECMO because of cardiac failure, had to go on VA ECMO conversion, then to VAV ECMO, and now is back on VV ECMO and doing very well. We learned so much that we 
from the COVID experience that we're having really, we're seeing real progress in how we're managing these patients. So I think that 433% increase that you saw from 2006 to 2011 is going to repeat itself in the next two, three, four years. And we gotta be prepared for that. That's gonna be a tremendous demand of, uh, of clinical personnel resources and uh, we don't have it right now. So er, that therein lies the paradox. I want perfusion to do this, but there's never going to be enough perfusionists to do this. So we need both, but you need to work together and be blended. And I think that's why we're gonna do the ECMO specialist training program, which is open to all perfusion, physicians, respiratory, nursing, but it is highly recommended that you are either a perfusionist, physician, or a nurse with at least three years of clinical, of uh, critical care, clinical experience to do that. That's recommended, but we can't, we're not gonna restrict people that want to go. Though I think respiratory can manage it we're going to really, this course is going to be a little bit more advanced and you really have to be sharp understanding your pharmacology, understanding your kidneys, understanding hemodynamics, understanding inotropes, chronotropes, all of these kinds of things to get the most out of the uh, course. So you guys give us some thoughts about everything that I just said. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, ECMO can be for the lungs, but it involves more than the lungs. So they're going to have to know the hemodynamics and the right. medications and anticoagulation strategies. And well, you have ECMO mobility. for ARDS, which we're just all used to. And if you're pediatric, of course, that's a different world. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to stay clear of it, but it obviously is there. I can't say yeah. it's not there. That's a different uh, uh, can of worms, if you will. But for adults, the world I live in, there's ARDS and there's VV ECMO, which has sort of become in focus because of, you know, with the spotlight on it, mm -hmm. but you have post cardiotomy syndrome still is going to occur. You have patients who have TAVR who are going to have a problem. You have patients who are just going to be in heart failure acutely that need help, have a big MI. There's going to be, there is the circulatory support component of it, but yet Absolutely. that tends to not be where the spotlight is. It's generally on ARDS patients with pulmonary failure and that ECMO is so much more than that. And then you have to be concerned about your hybrid cannulations where you have VA ECMO, but you start developing Harlequin syndrome. Mm -hmm. And now you have to do a hybrid and split that off and go VAV. Mm -hmm. You know what? I, 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 you got to have some skill to know how to do that and do it safely. And I, think, I, I think you're making some good points, Joe. I, I think, but I agree with you. I think the answer is not us putting our head back in the sand or us over inflating our capabilities, thinking that this can be a perfusion centric solution. The reality is it does need to be a hybrid. And I think setting the bar high, not to be not to exclude individuals who have a strong desire, but to make it very, very clear that we don't repeat some of the mistakes that we just spoke about a moment ago as it relates to pushing perfusionists through and that Vicki touched on pushing RNs through too quickly, not setting the expectation properly for what their career path really was going to look like. And ultimately you end up with the, some unhappy people, some unhappy employers and ultimately, the patient may not be getting the best care he or she deserves. So a hybrid solution specifically on the ECMO side, I think is, I think ultimately is going to be our best option. The only other comment I would add, and this takes us back a few slides, and I'm not suggesting you backtrack to this, but I think it would be very interesting to look at the data that corresponds to your slide that showed the number of cardiac programs increasing, the number of cardiac procedures by program decreasing, and mark the, the year that DRGs came into play and the role that they have had in that. Because mm -hmm. you are going to see a direct corollary 
That's, that's around the time that I got out of perfusion my first time and went to the business side, okay? You're gonna see an impact of that. It's not dissimilar to, if you look at the number of ADRs and what they've done since uh, tappers have come out, look at how that correlates to reimbursement, right? So there's a number of different factors that have an influence over our collective profession and over healthcare, quite frankly. Um, but since we're focusing on nursing and perfusion today, we'll, we'll stay a little stingy and greedy and just say our profession. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I, yeah, I, I agree. And the, ter the term used today is blended not hybrid, it's a blended program. So we, I, I want to be, I want to be sensitive to, you know, both pronouns and, and that, that in terms and, and labeling it's blended just so you know. So with that said, you bring up a very good point. There is so many tabbers done for what is considered to be clinically significant aortic stenosis, calcific aortic stenosis. But yet, notwithstanding the high risk, wasn't gonna get surgery to start with, they're just too high risk. The very old weren't gonna get heart surgery. You know, you gotta recover these people through, it's a big operation. We make it sound simple, but it's not, it's a big operation. You go through a lot in order to have that done. But in the low to moderate risk group, there's no way they referred those for surgery. Where did they all come from? So all of a sudden, now you've watched TV and there's the guy playing golf with his friend who has to have open heart surgery because he has aortic stenosis and his friend just so happens to have just had a taver a week ago and he's out playing golf already. I mean, really, this is just, in my view, it is profit to an extreme and it is absurd on its face in my perspective, though, I think it's a good procedure, but if the, if the patient is eligible and needs this to improve their long-term survival and quality of life, how come we weren't operating on all these people? This doesn't make sense to me at all. Okay. So we don't, you don't have to answer. It's rhetorical unless you want to. No, I was, I, I, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying, but think back, Joe, to when we first started and a patient would come into the hospital with chest pain. This is before angioplasty, atherectomy, stents. And what happened with that patient? That patient got put on a drip more, more likely than not, and they got put in the ICU, right? And they got care. And then ultimately, if they didn't improve, they may go for coronary artery bypass but you saw behavioral changes that were substantive. As soon as angioplasty stent atherectomy became viable procedures that were included in the reimbursement realm, even if that patient ultimately ended up with the coronary artery bypass, they may have had an angioplasty first, they may have had an atherectomy second, they may have had a stent placed, and then they went and had a, a two vessel or a three vessel coronary artery bypass. So again, there are multiple factors that feed into the growth or lack thereof or the changing dynamic of our profession. Yep, very economic. So a procedure that I think is very worthwhile to discuss is angiovac. So you can throw our slides back up. And uh, currently it is a soul perfusion uh, thing. I hope it stays that way. Uh, it's a very interesting procedure. I really like it. It's for the removal of unwanted intravascular material. And here you can see it. Uh, this being procedure done. is a minimally and invasive technique. I'm just going to turn the sound off. Access the you don't veins need to see often that. in the you neck. Don't need to hear that. Um, and so he talks about what it does. 
and I'm just going to get to the, but here it is. So you basically have a circuit, and this counts as an ECMO case, interestingly enough, and many times we will cut an oxygenator in line if we have fear that we are going to embolize anything. But you have your access, depending on where it is, is either going to be in the neck or the groin, and your return is going to be either in the neck or the groin. And let's see if we can get somewhere where it shows something. There's the catheter there. We've seen this before. And uh, let's say you had a vegetation with thrombus on your tricuspid valve, or you had an infected uh, thrombosed central catheter in the atrium. You can remove that material. I'm not going to do an angiovac talk tonight, but it's a very interesting procedure that has tremendous value, and then it all gets trapped there. And uh, it's a perfusion related thing. And let me show you this. You'll see the jumping line. See the jumping line? That means you have, you have engaged with whatever it is that you were trying to remove. So you get that visual cue. I think that's kind of interesting. Of course, I'm a very big believer in CVVH, Mars, TPE. Uh, it's uh, normally monitored by nurses. I think economically, it just has to be that way. But I think perfusionists should really understand CVVH. It has so much benefit. Mars, of course, all of these, which is molecular adsorption recirculation system, which is used for removing the big inflammatory mediators and some liver uh, treatments. And then of course you have therapeutic plasma exchange. And these are all extraporeal circuits. Of course, dialysis nurses frequently will run these things and nurses at the bedside will run these things as well. There you see a CRRT. I can turn the sound off so it's not so loud. Um, this obviously, and some might be Russia. I have no idea where that is. I don't, I, I can't tell what that is, but you're going to see two machines. One is doing a uh, CRRT or CVVH in its classic sense. And uh, you see the replacement fluid there uh, that's being given. And then look at the, look at the, to the chest tube bottles. That's pretty interesting. And we'll kind of move along. And then here you see, let's see if I can find it. There's the vent uh, or that, that looks mo either Mongolian, but look, you see two CRT machines. There's one here and one to the right. And so they're doing, and this one, uh, they look like they're doing plasma phoresis with, so it's a different, uh, a different filter, both at the same time on, on one patient. And I, that's a lot going on. You really need to kind of understand circuits and how they interact, because look at that. You've got five roller pumps, uh, one blood pump there that you see, and then replacement pumps and all that stuff. There's your Mars set. So that's what they're doing. So two machines going at the same time. Very interesting stuff. And there's the molecular adsorption. That's the Mars system. All right. Um, lots of opportunities, obviously, in uh, advancing technologies and advancing different techniques. You have TCD that I have here because we're going to talk about that here in just a second. So let's see. We're going to kind of, we do that. Let's talk about some new technologies, things that, and this is the issue with perfusion is there really isn't anything that new on the horizon. You know, we have, maybe this is, this is the um, Nautilus, uh, which is made by MC3 in uh, Michigan, Dr. Bartlett's company, which is uh, distributed by Medtronic. And it's basically a smart oxygenator. It's a, not, a, not a triangle or a square or whatever, or quadrangle, whatever you wanna call it, but a round oxygenator, which it should be. All oxygenators <laughs> should be round. I don't wanna get into that argument, but it's got sensors on it. It has, uh, uh, you can get saturation, pressures, temperature, um, and uh, this is a very kind of interesting, smart oxygenator, if you will. Of course, I've talked about the transonic mm -hmm. ELSA meter. I don't know how many times uh, it has such great utility. 
limitations like everything else does, but incredibly useful for measuring intraoxygenator blood volume. Uh, that, that way you know if your anticoagulation strategy is working well or not. And of course, recirculation in your VV ECMO plus multiple flow probes to measure hybrid mm -hmm. cannulations that you might be using. Of course, you have the Spectrum heart-lung machine, you have the new Levanova heart-lung machine, but really it's just a matter of looking cool. Um, it doesn't do anything different. It's a roller pump uh, that can be moved around. Um, so, you know, I think the highlight of the Spectrum, of course, is its data management system. EMR and Levanova is trying to compete with their Connect technology. Um, you have this thing here, which is the Spectrum Heater Cooler, which is the first non-water-based. It's uh, uh, glycol, gl uh, uh, yeah, glycol, uh, and um, that's what's used, but you have to use their heat exchangers. So the heat exchanger of your oxygenator that you're using for heart surgery or for ECMO cannot be used. It has to be their heat exchanger because it has not been tested with the uh, fluid material on the oxygenators that we use. So every procedure would need two separate external heat exchangers uh, in your blood circuit, increasing your volume and cost and everything else in order to use this. But it is a cool idea and maybe the direction we're going to be going. Uh, and then you have this, which we're gonna be talking about tomorrow, which is the world's first autonomous TCD. I'm gonna talk a little bit about TCD, but very, very little, but uh, it's, it's something that I think Perfusion can really understand and not having to be a sonographer in order to be able to run it. It's autonomous, it runs itself. And uh, I think the program tomorrow by, um, oh God, what's the name of the company again? I forgot the name of the company. Somebody help me out. Um, uh, we'll get the name and I'll tell you, I, I, I just forgot, I'm so sorry. Um, but nevertheless, it's a, it can be used in a variety of, uh, of, of applications, including cardiac surgery. And I think it's a, it's a very neat, interesting technology that we need to learn. Um, does anybody know who this is? If anybody can tell me who this is, they will win a special prize for today. Anybody, you gotta call in, you gotta tell me. Bill, Vicky C, anyone tell me who that is? Nobody knows? I have no clue. No clue, okay. So before I tell you who it is, we're gonna go to our data that I promised we were gonna go through. So currently, here are the perfusion programs that currently exist in the United States that are accredited, okay? Accredited U.S. perfusion. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Let's see if this works. Nope, none of those resources work. Accredited U.S. perfusion education programs by state. You've got Arizona with two, Connecticut, Florida, Illinois, Iowa, which just recently graduated their first uh, uh, group, uh, students, Nebraska, New York, you have two, Hofstra and SUNY. You have Ohio, Cleveland Clinic, Pennsylvania, TJU, Thomas Jefferson, and UPMC. Um, you went to the Thomas Jefferson uh, 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 ECMO specialist training program uh, up there, but they have a perfusion school there as well, which uh, is partnered, I think, with uh, specialty care. You have South Carolina, they've been in, in existence for a long time. Vanderbilt, been around for a long time. Matt is a good friend of mine, the chief down there. Uh, you have, of course, THI, the very first school, the icon of perfusion school uh, training, if you will. And then you also have the UT program run by uh, Rick Price, good friend of mine, wonderful person, good program. They're putting out some great uh, uh, students. Wisconsin, you have, uh, uh, that's for the United States. And then you have uh, in uh, Canada, and I can't find them. I don't know where they went to. I lost them. They were somewhere. Here they are, accredited Canadian programs. British Columbia, uh, in Toronto, of course. And uh, that's where 
uh, Dr. Uh, Mustard was from, uh, Toronto, and Toronto General, big, huge program. That's where Dr. Tyrone David is of the David procedure uh, for the uh, for aortic valve uh, and a ascending root. And then you have uh, the University of Montreal and uh, various things. So that's that, and we'll look at some of this. This is from the uh, 2022 sur or 2021 survey, I'm sorry, 61% uh, of perfusionists uh, have reported as being male in 2020, 2021, whereas actually it was the opposite way. And I want to go back and look at that because that's a very interesting um, thing. And I want to go back, if I can, and find that slide. And let me see here. It was in this data right here. Um, let's see what it says. Yep, there you go. So look at that. It was it was not in 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 uh, 2013. It was very similar all the way across the board. If you look at that, in 2010 it was 50 50 split. So there's always been a few more males, but look at today's data of uh, reporting people. Go back to that. And a full 61.6% .6 report as male. That's a much higher percentage than what you saw historically. So you're gonna be in the minority now. Okay, the but look at my group. My group is mostly women. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Or those that identify. Yeah. I have okay. to say it the right way. Okay. Um, age group, you have uh, people that are between 20 and 29 is 9%. 30 to 39 years old is dominated with 29%. Uh, but you still have 1% greater than 70 years old and up to 16.7% that are 60 to 69. I fall in that category, and uh, I know that one of our other employees, Amber Maurer, her, her father, uh, falls within that category. Actually, I think he falls in the greater than 70. Um, I think he's over 70 years old. He might be, might, maybe not. I don't know, Jim, if I, if I said that and you're not, I apologize. Um, gender identify uh, by range let's see find something here select the ways by which you were first introduced to the field this is a very interesting slide so um i was introduced to it in uh, new orleans at hotel do hospital where i worked because i worked at charity hospital you know, hotel do hospital doesn't exist anymore it's now called university hospital but i worked at charity and i also worked there and they did heart surgery there and that's where i got introduced to what perfusion was but people here while in college for a science degree 30 percent almost 31 previous employment and field exposed to perfusion, 29.4, that's going to be respiratory therapy, nursing, acquaintance who is, was a perfusionist, 29%, and then other, please specify, was 17%, but I don't know what it was specified to, high school career fair, 1.5%, so that's not high, that's not high, high, uh, that's not, that's not good ROI there, traditional media outlet, 1.3%, while in college for non-science degree, and then social media down at 0.6%. Okay, so how did you, what, what, what is your way you were first introduced to the field of perfusion? Definitely working in the ICU. Working in the critical care unit, being exposed to it. That's right. Bill? Well, mine probably falls into a really low category. So my girlfriend, when I was a senior in high school's father was J.B. Denman. And JB knew that I wanted to go to school and be a heart surgeon. He said, you know, maybe you come to, maybe you come to surgery with me tomorrow and see what I do. You can see what the surgeon does, but see what I do as well. And I, I was hooked. Was yeah, it. there you go. That is there so cool. What happened to that girl? Uh, to his daughter. Talk, we actually talk very frequently. Um, she's, a, she's a wonderful young lady. Her name is Kim Demon. She's been with Medtronic for probably 30 years. Um, as you know, JB passed a couple of years ago, which was, 
you know, a huge loss to our profession. He was a, he was an amazing man. Yeah. But, um, not, not your traditional path, but it was a, it was a path that ended up working out well for me. That's and really interesting. Very, that's really cool. That's an inter- that's a very interesting way to, to, to have that happen. So really you fall into the acquaintance who is, was a perfusionist because he, he was an acquaintance. He was your girlfriend's father. There you go. Yeah. That's very interesting. That's really interesting. Actually. Um, how many years have you been a CCP? So I fall into the 2.6%, 40 to 44 years. Of course, you're going to be brand new. So yeah, you're yeah. going to fall into, but how many years have you been a nurse? More than 10. I mean, how many years have you been a nurse? Not a critical care nurse working where I've worked with you. 10. 10? What did you do before? <laughs> I'm from Alaska, so you're from I Alaska. Fish. I, I mean, did were, did you do the deadliest catch? Were you out there getting crabs? I wasn't doing crabs. That's a season. I did B season, but yes, on the boats. On the boats? No way. <laughs> you bring that up now, huh? Oh, I got to learn some <laughs> stuff now. Okay, this is interesting. You know, that's what I love about this job is the most interesting people and gravitate towards it. You know, you got to be a little bit weird to want to do what we do. Not that you are, I'm not saying you are. Okay, a little, you have to be a little eccentric. I think this, all of us have such different personalities, but nevertheless, what do you think? Bail me out, will you? Listen, I, 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 you don't need to be bailed out. At the end of the day, we all have our idiosyncrasies. Do I think it takes a specific type of personality or characteristic traits to you know, gravitate towards perfusion in general? I think the answer is yes. I think Vicki would say the same thing for all the various genres of nursing. You, there, are, there are just certain things in our DNA that, that drive us to be in high intensity, high reward, meaning high reward because we're having an impact on a human life um, that not everyone has. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you this. Okay, so I got I to gotta, I gotta make a couple of comments. I'm amazed that you, because you are so incredibly knowledgeable, you impress me as a 20, I mean, you're young. I mean, and I realize that, but it doesn't compute with me because of how talented you are and knowledgeable you are and how much and 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 i'm just going to ask you point blank that doesn't come just inherently to all of us okay we all have to how did you get to where you are in such a short period of time i'm not sure how to answer that just hard working in the field learning about my patients trying to be the best for them that I could. A lot of studying, a lot, a lot of, of studying, self-learning. For sure. Because that's sure. ultimately what we do, listening. Well, and my mom was, my mother was in the nurse corps, so I grew up a lot around there. I did some like diploma nursing and things uh, where she was at. So it's not like I was completely new, but mm-hmm. I didn't get my nursing license until okay. 10 years ago. Okay. And that kind of, like it wasn't completely new. Mm-hmm. So I knew a lot coming in. Well, I'll tell you what, you're, you're, a, uh, you're a very unique individual because you could have just done anything. Um, I've watched you teach classes. I've seen you drawing complex pictures of anatomy on the ICU window uh, of the patient's room. Um, I, you impressed me as a person who's been doing what you do for 25 years. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something you should be very proud of. Uh, because you, it's impressive to me. Um, Bill, uh, when I look at this and you too, I mean, I mean, I can't even, I can't not say that you picked the mantle back up of clinical perfusion and did just an exceptional job in a place that is highly demanding with people who expect, um, not, I don't want to use the word perfection. They don't expect expect perfection. They expect that you care, that you're willing to understand the reasons for the way they like to practice. 
and that you are truly dedicated to your job, which entails not just the pump, but being a part of a team for whatever period of time you're gonna be there. You work in a very unique environment where people really work as a team and expect everyone to do their job with a level of not just expertise, but a level of care uh, in order to, uh, to work there and be successful. And you have done an exceptional job of that. Well, I appreciate that. I, I think that it's, I, I think it is a very unique program. And I think it is incredibly interesting to see such a specific group of personalities that have meshed and had the opportunity, me having the opportunity to now become a part of that, I think was a very, very long shot because that piece of the puzzle is a very specific shape. And if you don't fit into that, that spot on the puzzle, you just simply are not going to survive in the environment in which I find myself. But I'm, I've shared this with you before, Joe. I think that this is a perfect blend of quality care, uh, attention to detail, unbelievable communication, collaboration that you don't see at some programs that not just involves the perfusionist on a, on a basic level, but involves the perfusionist on some very thoughtful levels as it relates to the patient care patient selection, um, the interaction that we have with the nurses in the unit postoperatively is second to none of any facility that I've been in. And that says a lot given the fact that I've been in about 550 programs. Mm -hmm. So I am, I am very proud and very happy for the opportunity that I've been given. And I'm going to continue to try and do the best job I can do there. Good deal. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. And they're very thoughtful too, because I, I do think that perfusion, you know, by and large, we don't follow our patients postoperatively. It's very um, infrequent that that really occurs. Uh, and I know that they do that in your program. I try to do that where I'm at. Um, and, but I think that your program does stand out in that aspect where you really do spend the time to see how your patients are doing um, so that you can really understand how what you're doing, what impact it has, good and maybe not so good sometimes because this is heart surgery. Yeah, I think we've made heart surgery so, so routine, if you will, I think we sometimes lose sight of just how invasive the operation itself is and how durable a human being is to be able to go through all of that and come out the other side and uh, by and large with the high degree of probability of success do so well. So uh, I think that's very interesting. What I see in this slide, if you can put this slide up for me, I'd appreciate it, um, is that, you know, the average length of a career is probably, you know, you look at the military, 20 to 30 years, maybe 35 years. And there are, if you look at between 35 and 49 years, five, six, seven, eight, almost 9%. If you look at 30 to 34 years and add that in there, we're almost up to 20, we're at 20% of our workforce has 30 years of experience or more. That's a very interesting number given that we only went up a couple of hundred at that, not even, not even a couple of hundred. How many was it? 41 hundred and something to 42 something. It was like 87 yeah, or something 80s. like that. Not even a hundred. Um, years of experience by gender. I don't think that's really very important. Select the option. Well, that might be important. Let's look at it and see. 
Um, you know, it looks like uh, males stay in the profession longer just by looking at this. So you look at the number uh, on the right side, 45 to 49 years. So the, it starts to, to, to make a difference after 20, 24 years, 25 to 29 years. Uh, you start seeing the gap increasing in male, which is in blue, and female, which is in the orange. Um, I'm not sure what that actually means and don't want to speculate on it. Um, select the option, uh, your primary employment, academic health care center, 35%, community hospital, uh, 31%. It's kind of hard for me to read that. Yeah, 31.2%. So basically, it looks like, I mean, I, I find that hard to believe that, uh, that you have more in the academic center than you do in the, maybe that's of respondents, because most cardiac surgery is done at the community level, not in academic centers. Uh, and here, that, that bears out, 33%. Are, you know, so it's a higher number now, but just barely, but I think it's much uh, different than that. Small contract group, less than 25 CCPs is about 15%. Large contract group is about 12%. So you see that we're still looking at more in-house employment overall by these respondents. Remember, this is a survey. 92% uh, being full-time. Uh, alternative roles, select the, okay. All right, so with all of that said, oh, here, look, this is an important one. Select the healthcare providers who regular cover ECMO shifts at your primary institution, a full 63.7. Of course, this was during the pandemic, so I think that uh, that's important. A staff perfusionist, staff ECMO specialist was 34.3% and unit nurse, which means not an ECMO specialist RM, but actually the patient, the nurse taking care of the patient also managing the ECMO was a pretty high number, 18.9%. That's much higher than I would have thought. 18% do the initiations, 14% uh, use per diem uh, perfusionists, 9% use per diem ECMO specialists, and 9% did other please specify but i don't see the specification on here so i don't know what that specification was um i think that's very interesting and then here's a comparison of that same information from between 2017 and 2020 and uh, you can see that the number of staff perfusionists watching ECMO, even though ECMO went up, actually went down. 2021 data is in red, 2017 data is in black. So you see that uh, uh, staff ECMO specialists increased while that decreased. That is very telling and very important, I think, information. Um, so I think that's good. I think we can stop there and discuss a little bit, um, select how it impact. 78% um, said that their, uh, their uh, professional career trajectory has not changed. Again, other, please specify, but I don't know what that is. Prolonged, 4%. Hastened retirement plans, 4%, 4.4%. Caused me to change uh, perfusion employment, 3.4% uh, of people basically said, I'm not doing this and I quit and went somewhere else, which is fine. They didn't want to do it. But I will tell you that in the height of a pandemic, you take the slide down, thanks. In the height of the pandemic is not the time to do that. So with that said, it is what it is. I understand people are people and they're going to do what they're going to do. So before we run out of time, let me do two things. Um, Bill, I'm going to let you uh, uh, go ahead and talk to us about what it was like for you to finish your uh, 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 reintroduction into perfusion and have to retake your board successfully. So congratulations on becoming a CCP again notwithstanding everything that I just got through saying and in direct, I guess, response to everything that I just got through saying, you obviously came back to the profession because there you saw a tremendous need, a gap, 
and you wanted to recontribute, but that took a lot of work on your part to do. Uh, not an easy thing for anyone to do. How was the experience for you? How has it felt from a reward, personal pride for yourself, having reintroduced yourself to the profession and regained your certification and now being fully fledged uh, uh, certified clinical perfusionist through the ABCP? You know, the first word that comes to mind is it, it was overwhelming. And I think the reality is, and there's not a person listening to this, and neither of you would not be able to identify with this as well. It was 37 years from the first time I took the boards to the second time I took the boards. Wow. And I, and I can tell you with 100% certainty that your retention rate 37 years later, your ability to remember the formulas and all of the detail um, presented a pretty substantial challenge. You know, anatomy doesn't change. Physiology, to the largest extent, doesn't change. Understanding renal and hepatic function doesn't change. A lot of the palliative procedures for pediatric and neonatal uh, anomalies have changed. A lot of pharmacology has changed. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> yeah, they don't even have Bertillium anymore. I mean, E.T., he went into VTAC and they gave him Bertillium. It doesn't even exist. That is correct. And it, it, those are the... Those are the little pieces that when I first made the decision that I was going to come back and I was starting to think about how much I would have to put into the boards. Number one, I grossly underestimated the number of hours on a weekly basis that it would require. Um, and number two, I underestimated the number of changes that would have been in pharmacology and the number of changes that have taken place in the disposable aspect, not so much the hardware, the hardware is pretty much the same. But the disposables and the vacuum assist and this and that, those are, those are very new and unique characteristics for our profession. So I was blessed by a couple of things. Um, number one, I was blessed to be put in a program where I got to not only observe cases, but ultimately do cases with a perfusionist that I've known for 30 years that I have an enormous amount of respect for and admiration for and who had the patience to deal with somebody my age who had has been in all of the various roles that I've been in and and really gave me really gave me an opportunity to become part of that family. Um, that was a huge contributor to the ultimate success of getting through the boards. But what what I would encourage anyone to think about that's that's going to come back is if you're in a state that requires licensure, such as Texas, understand that that is the first step that you've got to get through. And it is not a walk in the park. It is a tremendous amount of data that has to be provided. Um, it takes time, effort, energy. You have to be patient through that process. As you start to prepare for your boards, be mindful that it is going to create an enormous amount of stress on your life. And it's going to take an inordinate amount of time. And what I mean by that is not just the obvious of the time you spent spend studying, but when I wasn't studying, I was beating myself up for the fact that I wasn't studying. So it, 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 the combination of those two end up sucking up a lot of time. So then you say, how do you feel what is now uh, six weeks and two days out from being <laughs> who's counting and my license being fully renewed and being full fledged certified perfusionist again. Um, I, you know, I, I, I still feel a little numb, quite frankly, the first few hearts that I've done since then, do I think they've gone better? Do I think that they've had better outcomes? I think that, I think that we've treated our patients the same way since day one. I'd like to tell myself that maybe I did an incrementally better job because now I have a few more initials after my name. But I think it's the sense of pride and the sense of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Because you do this for yourself. You don't do this to prove something to someone else. If that's your ultimate goal, I, I think it's going to be challenging to succeed. Mm -hmm. You have to want this for you. And mm -hmm. if you do, I think if I can do it, 
there's no doubt in my mind that others that are out there that recognize the enormous demand and need for dedicated, you know, focused healthcare providers in our environment, and just in the United States alone, much less globally, is tremendous. And if you've got the skill set and the desire and the aptitude to make a contribution, think about it. Because I, I spent 25 years on the business side of perfusion after my first round of practice. And I can tell you, it doesn't matter how many groups you buy, how many groups you sell, manage a P&L, manage the balance sheet, manage all these different programs. That is enormously rewarding as well. But it does not hold a candle to the feeling of seeing the relief on that patient's family's face when you can tell them after their loved ones in the unit and stable, there's nothing that compares to that. Very good. Well, you should be very, very proud of yourself. I'm certainly proud of you. I think you're, the, all of this group is proud of you. Uh, but I will tell you that, you know, having had dinner with you in Puerto Rico in 2000, and I don't know if it was 2001 or whatever year it was, it was some 20 something years ago, uh, uh, and, uh, and kind of getting to know you a little bit throughout the time, it doesn't surprise me that you've done so well. I mean, I just think that that's how you're built and how you're driven. And, uh, you know, we all have life. You had a daughter who was graduating from high school, getting ready to go to college in the midst of all of that goings on with you. Uh, and so life continues to happen and you know, it's a, it's a real challenge to have life with life, uh, outside of work when the type of work that we do is so incredibly demanding. And on top of all of those things, we had the, what was the pandemic and all of this just craziness going on with all of our schedules. So the accomplishment on its own um, is remarkable, but again, uh, notwithstanding, you should have a very high sense of pride. It doesn't surprise me knowing what kind of a person you are. So I'm very, I, I, for all of us, we're very proud of you. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to a great collegial relationship. And I know that you're gonna, you're going to impact a lot of patients, notwithstanding like Vicki C who is, uh, con has contributed in ways in what is really a relatively short period of time, um, is going to be one of those people in our profession that I'm going to need to take care of me because ultimately I'm getting towards the end. Hopefully I'm not going to need extracorporeal circulation or ECMO services, but if I do, this is who is going to be taking care of me. And this is the kind of people we need in this profession. And uh, you're gonna do really well too because you, you've done a remarkable job so far. Okay, um, we, have a, we probably have a silver alert. It's me, I'm fine. <laughs> you tell them, tell them stand down, I'm right here. Okay, we have a few minutes left. Slides please. Who is this? Okay, I'm gonna show you a video. It's a short video, it doesn't take very long. Let's just watch it. It's a fun video, you'll enjoy it, I hope. <laughs> Air Force balloonist, Captain Joseph Kittinger Jr. is laced into an elaborate pressure suit in preparation for a daring ascent into the stratosphere. Kittinger, who weighs 150 pounds, packs 155 pounds of suit and equipment. The scientific goals of Kittinger's ascent are to test a new six-foot stabilizer parachute designed to keep an ultra-high altitude jumper from spinning and blacking out before he can open the main chute. The balloon reaches the height 19 and a half miles.
Have you seen this before? Here, you can watch it on this. Okay, uh, do you read me, Felix? Activate suit and chest pack cameras. Disconnect the oxygen hose. Roger. Okay, John, I'm ready. There it is. There's a world out there. Seatbelt. That a boy. All right, stand up on the exterior step. Keep your head down, and our guardian angel will take care of you. Release the helmet tie-down strap. See if you can get a respiratory count. Speed 546. It's been falling 25 seconds. Speed 600 miles per hour. 650 miles per hour. Speed 700. Give it, you calling me? Can anybody understand him? One minute. One minute free fall. Crazy. I have been following speed for a long time. I have like a half hour.
seconds and stable as a rock. You look you're really stable when you fall in three and a half minutes. Four minutes free fall. Absolutely fabulous. I couldn't have done any better myself. Feel that go. Great going, Felix. Great going, buddy. So, go ahead and take the slides down just for a second. Every time a patient is rolled into the operating room to have surgery, till the time they leave the operating room, get to the ICU, get through all of their process, they're just like that guy that took the leap of faith at over 24 miles above the earth and just went off because it was all of the people that ran the system that got him to be able to do that in a safe way and record it, of course, for posterity. But that's the leap of faith our patients take. We have to remember that. Patients, patient families, whatever the case may be especially when they're elective. Not so much sure. when they're emergencies, but even then they still have to think about it. So put the slides up. Who was that good looking fella? It was me, <laughs> no, <laughs> my alter ego, Felix Baumgartner. So, all right, take the slides down. We're two minutes early. We got through this. We made it through the whole program. We filled all of the time spot as required by the ABCP. I killed them off earlier. I was here with two incredibly great people. One former perfusionist, current perfusionist, all in one bundle. <laughs> one exceptional nurse going to be a perfusionist. All of them around me. I couldn't be happier. I feel like Felix Bob Gartner all over again. We'll see you all tomorrow for another great program. Thank you, Bill. Thank Later, you, Vicki C. Peace out. Thank you, guys. Bye. <laughs>